What you find in most cases, if you look at the riots, if you call them, of the 1960s, almost all of them were sparked by some incident involving the police. And one of the results of that, I think, was that the security forces, the public safety forces in most cities employed very few black people. Even in areas that were predominantly black, I'm thinking now of, of my experience in Philadelphia. Rarely would you ever see a black policeman. The policemen typically were white policemen. And as the pressure of population in the communities increased and crime increased. There were a number of incidents of police brutality that were challenged by uh, black civil rights organizations, NAACP, the Urban League, and other organizations, but without much effect. It just seemed that the police forces were very rigid and insensitive to the needs of the local community, and in some cases just ran roughshod over people in the community. That tended to contribute to the buildup of this deep resentment against the police forces that, uh, was th that resulted in a striking out against police authority usually in the summer, almost all the riots started in the summer in July or August when it's very difficult with the heat and humidity in many cities, it's almost unbearable. But there was another factor that I think contributed to this, and perhaps this is a controversial way to look at it, but remember that in the, the mid to late 1950s and the early 1960s, there were major demonstrations for civil rights in the South. The massive demonstration for jobs and freedom in Washington, D.C. occurred in August 28, 1963. Martin Luther King's demonstration on the bus boycott was in 1956. We had television more widely distributed uh, in the early 1960s. And so people in the North could see what was happening in the South. And they could see many people. The, the, the 1964 summer in the South was widely covered on national television. And I think many young people in the North sat there and they watched that happening. And they looked around them and they probably said to themselves, why aren't we doing something up here to help our condition? Now, they didn't go out and demonstrate so much for the type of civil rights goals that were typical in the South, but there were major issues in the North that became the stimulus of demonstrations around jobs. Almost all of them focused around jobs. Let me give you an example of this. In the early 1960s, in many of the major cities, the city governments began to rebuild many public structures in the inner city, schools, libraries, public buildings. And because the employment in the construction industry was so discriminatory, much of the work that was done on those projects in the inner city was done without the participation of black people. And when many of them saw the demonstrations that were underway in the South for civil rights and equal rights, and saw this situation in their own hometown where public funds were being used to construct public buildings and they were not even a part of it, Many of them organized themselves to challenge that problem. It happened in Philadelphia with a man whose name was Cecil Moore, Cecil B. Moore, who was outraged at the attempt on the part of the city government to construct a new office building in uh, an area close to the uh, center city.
without one black person being employed on the job. And so their way of trying to get at that was to organize a demonstration around the construction site and to prevent the work from going on. Well, obviously, that immediately created a controversy with the construction workers and with the unions and with the city itself that wanted the work to go forward. And it was that type of challenge to authority that, in the view of the civil rights leaders of the North, was not sufficiently attentive to equal job opportunity that led to much of the discontent that just flared up in the form of uh, civil disobedience and riots, I think, w once they got started. And the outpouring of outrage, it's the only way to describe it, the sheer outrage, I think, on the part of many people, that here they were living in this community and so much was being done around them, they were not participating in it, and they wanted to participate in it, but they were being passed by and they were going to strike back in some way. But let me say this about that. Those riots were not actions simply of despair, but in a funny way of hopefulness. A person doesn't riot, they don't strike out, if they don't have some reason to believe that things can be better for them. Now, it might appear that that's a perverse way to express it, but it is. In contrast to what later happened, where many of the conditions, the socioeconomic conditions, in fact, are much worse in the inner city, but there are no riots. And I interpret that to mean that people today are far less hopeful and more beat down than were the young people in the 1960s who struck out in a very dramatic way in the form of riots when there was some incident that triggered it. The riots, or, or I prefer to call them civil disobedience, some have even called them insurrection. I don't like the term riot. In, in, in most cases, they were not really riots. They were just outbursts of outrage of people who just got fed up with the conditions they were forced to live in. But almost all of them started in the black community as a result of an incident, as I indicated, the incident with the police. And the result then was that the trouble was concentrated within the black community itself. Now, a rather perverse sort of thing happened. Uh, I remember the uh, disturbances in the cities immediately after Dr. King was killed in 1968, in April 1968. That followed incidents in previous years where it appeared that white businesses were especially the target for destruction and looting and burning. And so what happened, and I, I happened to go through West Side Chicago shortly after the disturbance in that, in, 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 in that uh, city. And there were a number of businesses where people had written Soul Brother on the window or uh, other indications that this business was owned by a black person, whether that was true or not, they, they put it there. And sure enough, in a number of cases, those buildings that were so identified as being black-owned businesses were spared. Now, that did not happen in the disturbances in 1964, 65, 67. But it did happen to a significant degree in many cities uh, in the disturbances that occurred in 1968. I can't explain that, except that there was a higher level of black consciousness about the importance of so-called black power by 1968 as compared with the earlier years. Remember that the black power movement caught hold in the urban centers of the North and the Midwest, not in the South. In the South, the Martin Luther King philosophy of Nonviolent civil disobedience prevailed, but not in the North. 
in the urban centers of the North, it was the black power philosophy that took hold and in many respects was a more powerful paradigm for organizing disobedience than the nonviolent uh, civil disobedience that was practiced in the South. In fact, I, when Martin Luther King organized a demonstration for fair housing in Chicago, and he marched through a park in Chicago, and I think it was a small town in Cicero, Illinois, I believe it was. He was greeted there with such vitriotic opposition and stoning and cursing that he said himself that he had never experienced that kind of hatred in any of the demonstrations he had conducted in the South. Also, Martin Luther King was killed in Memphis, Tennessee after he had gone there to lead a demonstration in support of sanitation workers, garbage workers. And the reason he went back to Memphis after having been there a few days earlier was that the earlier demonstration had been disrupted by black youth, by teenagers who had no commitment to the nonviolent civil disobedience that Martin Luther King was talking about. This was Memphis, Tennessee, a, 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 the urban variety of the socioeconomic problem involving black people. And so you had quite a difference in the tenor, the tone, the aspirations, the vision of black young people in the urban north and in some cities of the urban south than you had in other areas of the South during the 1960s, and that difference reflected itself in the kind of civil disobedience and the disturbances that were seen in the late 1960s. The disturbances of the 1960s, the riots, seriously exacerbated race relations in the North in ways that still have not been resolved over the past 20 or so years. There are cities where the conflict between the black and white communities is far more intense today than it was 40 years ago. Uh, the result is, is, is that there is a very difficult problem in achieving a common playing field between black and white people in many of our urban centers of the North. It's very difficult to find common ground anymore between the two because of the distrust and the fears. You can see that very clearly in politics. Yes, it is true that there are, that I think seven of the ten largest cities in the country today have black mayors. But I think if you examine the voting patterns in every one of those cities, you will find that those black mayors were elected by massive voter registration campaigns in which a majority of the black eligible voters were put on the voting rolls. And the black mayor was able to obtain upwards of 95, close to 100% of the black vote. I don't think there is a major city where a black mayor was elected with any more than 15 or 20 percent of the white vote. And so for all practical purposes today, what you have in large urban centers is a serious split politically between the black and white communities. It would not be unreasonable to say that the vast majority of white people simply will not vote for a black person for a major position. And I think that does grow out of many of the difficulties of the late 1960s and, and, and much of the fear that exists on what might happen if a black person is elected to the top 
executive position in the city. What will that person do? Will that person uh, principally serve the interest of the black community or will that person serve the interest of the larger community? I think it's fair to say that in almost every case, black mayors have served the interest of the larger community, but they've had to earn their spurs. It's been an uphill struggle to gain the confidence of white voters in most urban centers. 